Greetings, stranger, and welcome to Ghastly Tales. Here you will find stories to chill your bones, stop your heart, and tear at your very soul. Now, pull up close to the fire and listen closely, for outside it grows cold. The primeval cold of northern wastes, of black forests, of midnight sun and eternal darkness, of deep time and forgotten things that live among us still. This is the story of the architect and the outdoorsman by Mick Maas. How bleak these icy fields are. Frozen grass crunching beneath my boots, step after step. There are the faint cracks and thuds of branches breaking under the heavy loads of snow. Sound carries well over these plains. Once in a while the mockingly cheerful warbling of a bunting and the wind, always mumbling, sometimes howling. The same wind, ice cold, relentlessly caressing my unprotected face and hands, tightening the skin, scraping it raw, my face a desperate grin as tears and snot freeze. There is a dwelling in the distance, no smoke coming from the chimney. I still have some deer meat left in my pack. If there is no water, there'll be some snow under the trees on the edge of the forest some more miles in the distance. If there is no dry wood, I'm fucked. There is dry wood, neatly stacked in a pile next to the wood stove. There is even water, frozen in a bucket. I don't know how old, but I don't think I can make it to the forest for fresh snow. I cook it in a battered kettle and throw in a femur with some scraps of meat left on it. The hovel, a pathetic log structure with leather flaps covering glassless windows, starts to warm up and to fill with the smell of boiling game. There is a sack mattress in one of the corners, a plank table with two rickety chairs in the other. There is the wood stove and a crude sideboard. The floor is dirt. Deer antlers hang over the doorway. To me, it feels like a five-star hotel. I roll a cigarette from my pouch of tobacco, nearly gone now, and smoke it while I wait for the broth to finish. I stoke the fire and lie down on the mattress. I am warm. There is food in my stomach. It has been days since I've experienced both feelings. Sleep comes instantly. When I awake, it is still day or night. It is hard to tell when the sun never sets. I throw some more chunks of ice into the kettle and add a handful of pine needles. I pour this improvised tea into a tin mug and step outside. The wind immediately greets me with an ice cold embrace I steel myself against it and take a sip of my beverage, scalding my mouth but welcoming its warmth nonetheless. The frozen fields from where I walked stretch out into the distance, surrounding the cabin on three sides. The forest some distance to the north, pines almost black in the colourless environment. This is where I will go. But not today. I allow myself a morning cigarette, although I know my supply won't last. I enjoy it, for I feel safe. There are the bones of a goat in a gated pasture next to the cabin, but nothing else of interest. It's okay. I cook the last of the deer fat over the stove, adding some pine needles and sip on the brew. There is even some left to pour onto my canteen. I sleep again. I don't need to save daylight. It's one of the few resources I have aplenty in this godforsaken place. I tear open the mattress and put handfuls of dry straw into my pack. I also take the mug and a relatively sharp knife I find in one of the drawers of the sideboard. The previous owner won't miss it, and if they will, their circumstances will probably be much better than mine. The weather will be milder, and judging by the distance from any kind of civilization, they'll probably have a car. Looking at the state of the place, I don't really think the owner will ever come back. I don't feel guilty. In the woods now, 
The cold is still bitter, almost tangible, but the wind is far less of a problem here. Snow covers the ground, trees obscure the sky. It is much darker here, which feels welcoming after walking for ages through daylight. Branches snap and break, the chittering of the bunting much closer now. I wonder how they feed themselves. Are there insects in this frozen forest? Berries? It does not matter. There are tracks in the snow. Here, deer. I hope they will lead me to fresh water. They do. A partially frozen lake, fed by a rushing river. The water around the bank sheeted by only a thin crust of ice. This is where the animals hardy enough for a place like this come to drink. I crush the ice with my boot and fill my mug with the clear water. Drink it down carefully, however cold it might be. This walking has got me hot and thirsty. I know I will have to make a signal fire soon, but not yet. I might trap a hare if I'm lucky. Go on for another couple of days. I don't know how far I am from the cave, but I feel like I am drawing near. I feel like I can make it. It has been a year since he's been taken from me. A year of not waking up next to him has been harder, colder than the frostbite and hypothermia threatening me in this frozen wasteland of a country. I make a fire in front of a fallen tree. I crawl under the tree. The fire is small but warm enough. Its heat is reflected against the wall of pine behind me. I drink lukewarm broth from the canteen, slightly warmed by the heat of my body. I smoke another cigarette and think of him. He was the manly, adventurous type. Me, more effeminate. I hated the cliché, fought against it, but I knew that was how people saw us. <sighs> if only they could see me now. But they don't. And again, it does not matter. He was muscular, I am scrawny. In the end, they got him. Maybe they will get me too. Tonight. They would spare me the effort. They did not get me, so I keep going. I haven't felt this close to him for a long time, even though I know, I don't want to, but I do, that he is dead. There is cold, there is hunger, there is exhaustion, but I keep on going. Love is greater than these things. I know this seems cringeworthy, but it is a truth I feel, so I don't give a fuck. Even if I die, frozen, maybe never to be found, I will have died trying to find out what happened. This thought consoles me. He had been obsessed with them. It irritated me, but the passion and dedication he felt was part of why I loved him so much. Maybe I was jealous. But that was another world than the frozen one I am in now. Speculation is useless. I did hate him for going. With his usual bravado, he promised to come back to me. With proof this time. Actual proof they are more than folklore. But it felt wrong. Hollow. A last desperate effort. I know those that financed him were getting restless. I wanted to make a scene, but let him go. If he hadn't, I knew we would have been through anyway. He'd hate me forever for stopping him. No use dwelling on this now. I am so close. I feel it. I managed to trap a hare. I skin it, like he showed me, and skewer it, roast it above the fire, the smell of the searing meat a dizzy in contrast with the sterile frozen air. Look at me, I think, wryly. Look at me gnawing straight from the bone, carefully saving the organ meat for when I really need it, almost drooling at the prospect of eating it later. He would have been so proud. If it hadn't been for him, I would have starved. On the other hand, if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't have been here in the first place. I can't deny it is beautiful, though. It is a goddamn shame it had to come to this for me to finally see it. But I do see it now. The never setting sun trying to cast shadows through the obscuring pine trees, the whiteness of the snow, the deadly peacefulness. His love for isolation infuriated me. I felt left out, but I think I get it now. I fall asleep in front of the fire, thinking about the lust in his eyes if he'd ever seen me like this. 
I wake up, and I know I am being watched. There was some kind of communication, guttural noises that tear me from my sleep. I think I hear footsteps, but they fade. The beauty of it, he had said, is that they are not evasive at all. Natives just don't want to come out and confront them, but I can find them. I will find them, and then we'll be rich. We already are, you fool, I had thought. Both successful in what we did, we lived very well. An architect and an outdoorsman. Me creating the structures he so longed to get away from, the fucking irony. But he wanted to find them, to make contact. It was his life's passion. They are gone now, but they'll be back. I am on the outskirts of their territory, and they know I am here. The forest is vast and frigid. It now tires me. More often I hear those who are watching me, more often I hate them. They mark their territory with bound twigs, carefully assembled piles of small rocks and rabbit skulls. I imagine Bruce's delight at finding these, and hate them all the more. Come then, you fuckers, I growl from clenched teeth. But they do not come. I make camp, light a fire, throw branches onto a pile to sleep on, eat the hare's liver, drink pine tea, sleep. I track the markings and find a clearing, and the entrance to the cave, which is actually more of a mound, a heap of snow-covered earth with a hole. They have placed goat skulls on poles both sides of the entrance. The skulls grin at me. I grin back. This is it then. I am too tired and starved to even consider losing my nerve. I drop my pack and dig out a flashlight. The mound is about twice my size and height, the top of the entrance coming to my hips. I get on my knees and go in. The entrance is a tunnel. I crawl through it until I enter a room. It is barely high enough for me to stand. It is warm in here. I haven't been this warm since the cabin in the fields. The air outside smells of nothing. The air inside smells of earth and rot. Crude tallow candles burn here and there. There are other holes, but I cross the room and pick the one right across from me. Another tunnel, another room, this one bigger. In the center a slab of stone, more tallow candles. In the walls are arched indents with earthen shelves. In each one there is a skull. Most are human. I see also reindeer, wolf, and things I do not recognize. Some are ancient, others still have meat on them. There must be hundreds. I shine my flashlight and find Bruce almost immediately, his chipped front tooth that I would not let him replace because I loved how hard it made him look. I roar. I once again challenge them to come and get me. Once again they do not. I can hear them giggling. It comes from the tunnel and echoes against the skull-covered walls. Rage consumes me. I grab my lover's skull and crawl and walk and crawl. Tunnels, more rooms, underground abodes with filthy straw piles and carven stone trinkets. The giggling is everywhere, but I do not find them. The rage passes and I find myself outside in the clearing. You were right, Bruce. They are real. They wanted you because you loved them, but they will not show themselves to me because I hate them. They enjoy my suffering like they enjoyed your love and fascination. They live on mockery. I walk away, your skull safe in my pack. I make a signal fire and wait. I am nearly starved to death when they find me. In the helicopter, somebody asks me what happened. I mutter, and deal a vera miltera, make a some of your folklore is very real. I see her nodding with a pained look on her face before I lose consciousness.
This has been a Ghastly Tales production. Narration by Martin Yates, story by Mick Maz, with accompanying music by Deusterkilte. For more black ambient sounds to haunt your dreams, check out vitriolumrecords.bandcamp.com. Additional music was provided by Michael Whitehouse. For full credits, please see the description. I hope you've enjoyed this reading. If you have, don't forget to subscribe to Ghastly Tales on YouTube and stalk Ghastly Tales Presents on Facebook for more horror narrations, dark documentaries, short films and live-streamed hangouts with the Ghastly Tales Cabal, amongst other delights. If you prefer your chills on the go, our narrations and spoken word content is available as the Ghastly Tales Horror Show on iTunes and all good podcasting apps. Good night, listener, and sweet dreams.